Hello Davey here. So a couple of weeks ago I was looking into large capacity SSDs with the idea to consolidate a few drives into one large capacity SSD and then not have to send a few drives into each build that I do for build testing and general purpose use. So while I was looking into that I was looking into just SSDs in general and looking at the cheapest possible SSD on the market and it was underneath £20 but it was nothing special. It was a 60 gigabyte something or something uh, from someone or someone. Uh, I couldn't remember what the thing was but I was looking into more serious really cheap alternatives in the 120 gigabyte range and I came across this crucial BX500. I was initially looking at the MX500 one terabyte for my large capacity SSD but for one reason or another I haven't chosen to do that and the main reason being the prices are going to drop next year and I'm looking to upgrade to two terabytes instead of a single terabyte. Anyway onto this one. This cost me £24 and it is a 120 gigabyte SSD from Crucial the BX500. Now what I wanted to do was test this alongside I believe it was um, SanDisk's US900 or something like that but that was an idea of mine but all of a sudden a relative of somebody I know had a laptop that was becoming slow and they were looking into getting a new laptop entirely and I said whoa wait there let me have a look at it and we'll see if we can do something about that. So I grabbed the laptop and I found it had one of these. This is a Seagate one terabyte two and a half inch SSD that spins up to 5400 rpm now if you're in a similar situation yourself when you purchased your laptop you only had i don't know uh, checking emails kind of money then you might be in a similar situation and looking to do something similar uh, i.e completely change the computer because it seems a little bit slow so i then thought to myself these were really cheap and considering the person that owns this laptop doesn't actually use the one terabyte capacity and uses more like 30 gigabytes on top of the uh, on top of the Windows install, then it looked like a prime opportunity to test this drive out and similar drives with similar specs you can sort of, you know, extrapolate the data from. So I proceeded to tear down this one, i.e. take this drive out, transfer the data over and, you know, hunky dory. We can get on with our lives, I can finish off my testing with this one, but unfortunately that didn't quite happen. What ended up actually happening was the Windows system became corrupt for one reason or another, whether that's something to do with Lenovo's sort of proprietary install on this drive, I don't know. I know I've had issues with HP drives and that sort of thing in the past, so one reason or another I had to completely reinstall Windows, a new copy, onto this drive, which is what's installed on here now. In terms of testing these drives, I put the 5400 1TB Seagate drive through its paces in the laptop in its original condition. I tested AS, SSD, Atto, Crystal Disk Mark and User Benchmark and I took the relevant results, um, which I went into quite an in-depth sort of smorgasbord of results which we'll go through in a second, and I used those to compare it to the new drive in its new form in the laptop. So without further ado, let's check out what the results are like. Uh, this isn't a sort of learning how to transfer data because frankly other people can do a better job of that but bringing raw data is something that I can give you. We also did a short test in terms of booting from shutdown all the way into Windows and then getting into uh, into Google Chrome and onto YouTube just to see how long it would take and we will compare those results at the end as a sort of real world benchmark. But without further ado let's check out those results. So first things first, what system specs are we testing with? Well, to keep things as realistic as possible, I'm testing both drives on the laptop itself. So both the original old 1TB 5400 RPM hard disk drive and the new 120GB Crucial BX500 SSD have been tested as part of the laptop system. So the CPU I've been working with is an Intel i3-6100U, which is a dual-core, four-thread CPU clocked at a dizzying 2.3 gigahertz. We also have four gigabytes of RAM that's soldered to the motherboard of this particular model and runs at a mind-melting 2133 megahertz. The rest of the system is pretty self-explanatory, just the standard Lenovo IdeaPad proprietary hardware. But an extra nugget of information worth knowing is the laptop was plugged into the wall and running on the performance power optimized setting. So let's on some benchmarks. We'll start off with the lighter results and get into the heavier data further down the line. Starting off with user benchmark, I've got a graph prepared which we'll look into in a minute, but the overview of the tests holds some pretty interesting information. The top of the overview page shows some minor improvements from the upgrade. There's a 4% improvement in the desktop category and a 1% improvement in the workstation category, which is virtually negligible. And the gaming category remains summarized as tree trunk, which is funny but isn't exactly unexpected. For more insight on 
on this, there's a simple breakdown of the results below this. There's some variation in the CPU and GPU results, which can be regarded as testing tolerance, but there's a clear turnaround in the boot drive performance. Moving down to that drive performance part gives us much more data to deal with, but this is no way to compare numbers, so I've simplified this into a graph to help visualize the performance difference. Something not shown on my graph is the deep Q4K test, which the benchmark didn't attempt to run on the hard disk drive for reasons which are obvious if you've read into heavy IO requests between hard disk drives and SSDs, more on this later. The user benchmark program successfully ran through four different tests for the drives in two different variants. I've split the tests up and color coded the sequential results in blue and the random 4K results in green. Comparing the hard disk drive to SSD performance differences is like looking at night and day. You can read the results for yourself, but summarizing what's going on here, averaging the sequential and random 4K performance, we have a 2,500% increase in read performance, a 3,700% increase in write performance, a 1,800% increase in mixed operation performance, and a 220% increase in sustained sequential performance. Now, some of those figures seem way too high, but remember, that's the average of each test lumping sequential and random random 4K results together. If we focus on the individual performance of these two types of testing, we find the average performance increase during sequential operation is 360%, in other words 3.6 times faster, but the previous averages were skewed far higher by the random 4K performance difference of over 5000%. If you're interested in knowing more about 4K sectors with relation to hard disk drives, I've linked to an interesting Seagate article about the transition from 512 byte to 4K sectors in the video description. Anyway, that's enough from user benchmark, let's move on to the AS SSD test results. To no surprise, there's more of the same here, but like the user benchmark test, the 4K 64 thread test was called off for the hard disk drive again. However, this time I cancelled it as I was quoted a test time of over two hours for the read operation alone. And considering the write performance is worse than the read performance on the hard disk drive, I wasn't all that interested in waiting for, say, five hours for another figure below one megabyte per second to appear. On the other hand, the SSD ran through the 4K 64 thread test in about 30 seconds. High thread workloads are all about high numbers of requests for data. Hard disk drives struggle here due to their latency issues with moving parts, but SSDs excel in comparisons thanks to their lack of moving parts. On to Crystal Disk Mark, I performed 8 tests increasing the transfer size to each test. I could go over each test in detail like the last couple, but at this point it's just repetition of what we've seen already. So instead, I'd like to move on to the extremely colourful Atto Disk benchmark results. I performed three different tests with Atto, changing the queue depth for each test, but the total transfer length remained at 1GB throughout. Starting off with a queue depth of 2, the hard disk drive maxed out its transfer rate at the 8KB transfer size mark, where it hit about 100MB per second, whereas the SSD continued to push its transfer rate up to around 500MB per second at the 512KB transfer size mark, where it started to even out. Now, even out sounds like a pretty weird term to use when we're looking at the performance of the SSD. It appeared to have some pretty inconsistent results here and there, but I'm sure after many runs, these would average out to be a more pleasing set of data. But frankly, I think the point has been made and time is of the essence, so let's move on to a queue depth of 4. Here, both the SSD and hard disk drive have increased in performance in comparison to the 2Q depth run. The hard disk drive tops out at 100 megabytes per second again for both read and write speed, but a little earlier in the transfer size window, but the SSD pushes read speeds past 560 megabytes per second, which is nearly saturating the 6 gigabit per second SATA 3 interface. And pushing up to a Q depth of 8 doesn't see any more noticeable large improvements in performance for the hard disk drive or SSD. There are some minor improvements in the lower transfer sizes, but that's about it. In summary, we saw the hard disk drive hit read speeds of about 100 megabytes per second compared to the SSD's 560 megabytes per second, and write speeds of the hard disk drive topped out at about the same 100 megabytes per second in comparison to the SSD's roughly 500 megabytes per second. And last but not least, the boot test. So this test is to power the system on from a power off state, log into Windows, then load Google Chrome and head over to youtube.com as fast as possible. Starting off the race to YouTube, we're watching back the footage at 10 times its original speed. And at just under 36 seconds, the version of the system with the SSD had completed the challenge. After a long black screen, the hard disk drive version finally booted into Windows. But there was a fair wait while the hard disk drive was attempting to load all the assets of Windows and free up enough resources to load up Chrome. This all being after the startup programs were purged. 
138 seconds after the SSD version, the hard disk drive finally made it to YouTube. Now, some of you may be thinking, what's really the point of this test? But that will probably be the minority of people, because most people would understand that if this was, say, your checking emails laptop, you'd have to wait an additional two minutes before you could attempt to read an email. The value of an SSD over a period of time, in terms of effective speed, becomes exponentially more valuable in comparison to a hard disk drive. For instance, my 3-year-old Samsung 840 EVO cost over £200 when it was bought new, but still provides a 30-ish second boot time to this day. So let's say in a 3-year period, the first year with a fresh hard disk drive would yield a boot time of, say, 30 seconds or so. Not entirely realistic, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Then, after the first perfect year of performance, the performance drops for the next two years to an average boot time of, say, 2 minutes. Better than the testing in this video. So that's a boot time delta from the SSD compared to the hard disk drive of about 80 seconds. So if over the final two of the three proposed years you booted that system up once per day, you'd have waited an additional 16.2 hours for the system with the hard disk drive to load. Of course this is rather sensationalist, but with the prices of SSDs being so low now, and on the cusp of dropping further next year, it's food for thought. There are a few factors in this testing that haven't been taken into account. The first is that you may have a slightly faster hard disk drive that transfers maybe up to 100 megabytes per second faster than the one tested in this video. However, that would still mean you have another 300 megabytes per second of transfer speed headroom with an SSD. You may also have multiple slots within your laptop to store more than one drive. So you could get a fast boot SSD and a slower hard disk drive for more affordable high storage capacity. But if you don't have another slot to store another drive, I think the biggest potential barrier here is the storage capacity of the two technologies at any given price. At the low end of £20, you can get 120GB of SSD storage, or 250 or even 320GB of hard disk drive storage. But if you can push up to £30 or so, you can double the SSD storage to about 240GB at the time of recording, which is starting to reach a more reasonable territory for most laptops, in my opinion, at the time of recording. So the questions that remain if you're looking to do something similar are, is your laptop slow enough to warrant an upgrade? Speed is fun, but like with a car, if you can work with what you've got, then do you need to spend more money? Of course, we're only talking 20 pounds here, but the same goes for other parts of your system or larger capacity drives. Do you actually need the whole 500 gigabytes or one terabyte of storage on your laptop? Could you perhaps use both an SSD for a boot drive and a hard disk drive for large capacity at a cheaper price to create a hybrid storage system at a reduced cost? Now I'm not talking about SSHDs here, solid state hybrid drives. Those really aren't any good at anything to be honest. They're not very fast and they will have a similar performance drop off to a standard hard disk drive and they'll never have the speeds of an SSD due to the small SSD cache they have on board. And is the capacity you require affordable at SSD prices? Remember, SSD prices are predicted to drop in 2019, so it may be worth hanging on like I am if you're looking for a much needed 1 or 2 terabyte SSD upgrade. As for the BX500 in this video, I bought the 120GB version at £24 before recording the video. Four days later at the time of editing the video, it went down to £21, and at the time of writing this now, it's now at just under £20. So as they say, watch this space. So there we have it. I think it's very interesting that these days you can pick up a 120 gigabyte SSD for under 25 pounds that can nearly saturate the six gigabit per second interface of SATA. So if you want to pick up this drive or anything through Amazon, you can head to the Amazon affiliate links in the video description, and those will take you to your various regions page for this drive. If you purchase this drive, a laptop, some toilet roll through those Amazon affiliate links, then it will give a small kickback to the channel between four and 12%, depending on what you buy and depending on your region. And here's me cutting through the rambling just to make sure I don't go on too much further. Um, thank you very much for checking this one out. Uh, if you do purchase this drive, it is always uh, worth noting that this one does come with free software to allow you to clone your previous drive, but you can pick up trial versions of software elsewhere, uh, but it is interesting to have. So thanks for checking this one out. I really hope you enjoyed it and you gained something from it, and I will catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.